course, our number nine shaft. Originally sank in the year 1900. That's when we started to develop our second level. Now, folks, this is the only mine in North America that you can tour where you can actually still lay your eyes on an intact elevator shaft. Now, at this present time, our mine does have four separate levels to it. Where we're standing on the first, we're right around 200 feet below the surface. Now, you would find our second level below us about 180 feet. Our third, well, that's around 190 feet below the second. And our fourth, well, we're not exactly sure by the drawings. It's somewhere between 180 and 190 below the third. But at least we do know that the total depth of our shaft, from surface to the very bottom, is 715 feet. Now, folks, if you find that impressive, this was actually one of the smaller mines found in this valley at one point in time. So I usually talk about the number, number eight and number seven. Number eight was only about a quarter mile or a little less to our west and a little bit to our north on the other side of the mountain or other side of the valley. That had eight separate levels to it. it went over 1,500 feet below the ground. Now if we move down to our no number seven, about three quarters of a mile to our east, well that one again had eight separate levels, but that one went over 1,750 feet below the surface, folks. Quite impressive. Now I don't know how many miles of tunnel those mines had, but at least I do know that this one has roughly 26 miles of tunnel amongst its four various levels. Jeez. Now when this elevator was in operation, folks, that steel cable you see, it's only just hanging in the ceiling today, but that of course once upon a time went all the way to the surface. Now there it would have routed through a structure that we refer to as the head frame. It is a structure that does still stand to this very day. And we do have a poster of it hanging here for you folks to give it a better look. Now, in the head frame, it would have routed around one of two large iron wheels. That was the head frame's main purpose, was to support those wheels. Then the cable would go down the mountain a short distance to a hoisting shanty. Now, this elevator, again, originally powered by steam, but it had its own steam generation plant, own boiler plant, up on the surface, right with that uh, hoisting shanty. And that's where the control operator for the elevator spent his shift. So if you're a coal miner down inside the mines, well, our communications with the surface were rather limited. In the earlier days, it was through the blowing of a whistle, later replaced by the ringing of a bell. We could say one for stop, two for up, and three for down. And that's the full extent of our communications, folks. Now the coal miners would frequently ride the elevator to get to their assigned level of work for the day. It was much easier than some of the alternatives. But folks, they would ride it just as you see it parked here. There was no additional guarding, fencing, or any other protective devices for the miners. They would simply be afforded that handle above their head to hold on to, and that layer of iron or steel above their head called a bonnet. Because, well, in the year 1900, we didn't have nice polymers. We had a soft canvas cap. It really offered little to no protection at all for the miners. It was really there more to hold the lamp. So, a depth of 715 feet, even a rather small piece of debris could be very detrimental if it fell on a miner's head. You see, the bonnet has served the miners quite well. So now to move on to these rooms that we see in this area, folks. Now, I don't know how well you could see out of the car riding in here. It's usually pretty difficult. But you may have so noticed some rooms as we were coming in off to the side on our main tunnel. Now, some of them don't have these nice block walls here. Prior to our modernization, of course, none of them did. They were just simply carved out of the solid rock. <coughs> now, their purpose? Well, this is a production environment here. And as with any production environment, equipment gets used pretty hard. And that means that will inevitably break down. So if that happens, say, right where we're all standing, for example, it takes roughly seven to eight minutes from this point to haul something back outside of our portal. And another seven to eight to haul it back in. I don't know about you folks, but that sounds like a lot of waste of time to me. And that means we're wasting money. So if we would install these rooms whenever we had the opportunity, strategically, through all of the tunnels and each and every level of the mine, and simply have them stockpiled well with parts and tools. When something did break down, we simply had to go to the nearest repair shop that stocked the supplies needed. We could repair it right inside of the mine, on site, saving that time, which means more money in my pocket. Now this room in particular, folks, in the latter days of the mine, did become our foreman's office. So that makes me to cover some of the extra duties of our foreman. Now he was still a coal miner himself. He still had to go out and mine coal. That was the bulk of his pay. He only got a small bonus to go with these foreman duties. Now the first of which, 
He had to arrive early, first, here for his shift. He had to ensure that every miner was here, checked in, fully prepared and on time for the day. Now, a little bit more importantly, folks, our foreman had to stay late after his shift. He had to ensure that every miner checked out, because if somebody didn't check out, well, he might still be inside of the mine. He had to track them down and figure out what happened, possibly even assembling a rescue team if needed. Now, folks, there's one more duty of our foreman to mention. In the earlier days, this was an immigrant workforce here. We would have had anywhere from 10 to upwards of 16 different languages being spoken on any given day in just this mine alone. So, of course, our foreman had to play interpreter. He had to facilitate all the communications amongst the various nationalities that we found living in our valley at that time. Now, folks, we're going to begin to file in a single file line past our elevator shaft. I will say that we do have an opportunity that we can look down. Now, of course, this is only a tourist operation here today, so to help keep the cost down, well, we have no active pumping operations being performed. So when we do look down our shaft, we will eventually see water. Now, folks, this is a very consistent level. It's where the water table naturally rests in this valley. So even if you were to drill a well, for example, it's that same aquifer you're trying to hit, same depth. Now, folks, it's right around 200 feet below us. Now, that's very convenient because, remember, we're right around 200 feet below the surface. It gives us an excellent visual of how far under the earth we are. Now, the last cautionary word, folks, if you have any loose objects, those cameras, any glasses, hats, just make sure they're very secure because, well, if something falls down the shaft, the water's only about 300 feet deep. I'm sure it'll make a wonderful artifact for future generations, folks. So on that note, if we begin to follow me. Chase, what's your 